My name is Mamadou Diabara, uh, and uh, at TIAS here, um, very fortunate fellow um, from Point Sud, uh, Centre for Research and Local Knowledge in Bamako, and from the Goethe University in Frankfurt, uh, Germany. Um, I was interested, I'm still interested in the situation of local artists in Africa uh, trying to find their way between what they always did in their local context as artists, as griots, and what they should do nowadays when they, as artists, are going through radio, through television, through a production of uh, CDs, DVDs, uh, earlier of vinyls or tapes, what does it mean for them to go from this world they perfectly know that say is local law, is local context, and the other one governed by copyright? How should they do? What do they do? And this is it, uh, the situation I'm interested in as anthropologist and historian. What does it mean for a musician who know very well, who knows very well uh, what does it mean for him, for her, uh, to depend on local patrons uh, from whom he's getting, she's getting uh, money or she's getting presence um, in, in performing, of course, and then in uh, entering another system uh, now governed by radio, television, copyright. And what I'm trying to do is to look at the concept of copyright, the reality of copyright, for example, uh, as you know, uh, in the European context, the Western context, uh, copyright had to do with books, it had to do with writing, it had to do with works. What does it mean when these copyright invented in the 19th century um, is introduced through colonialism in Africa? And what does it mean for ordinary people nowadays? This is what I'm trying to grapple with. Uh, conducting field work uh, in Mali, uh, the country I'm coming from, and in uh, Burkina Faso, uh, the neighboring country, and in Africa, generally speaking. So the point is for me in how much these copyright when the World Trade Organization uh, through the WIPO, the World International Property Organization, introduced uh, these copyrights in Africa in the 70s. What does it mean for local musicians, for local performers, and for ordinary people? We see that uh, this privatization of these so-called cultural good is not only limited to Propertization of cultural good. We see also the propertization of uh, genetical goods as well at work. Uh, let's say uh, when we see uh, scholars um, um, working with our plants and extracting out of them uh, these uh, genetical resources, you have parallelly to these cultural resources, you have genetical resources. And it's the same rational behind in promising a sort of uh, romance of development, romance of development funded, funded on um, our so-called cultural goods, it's, it's speaking about goods, and uh, based also indeed on these uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, goods. Uh, these copyright introduced in an artificial way, so to say, uh, in these countries, did it work uh, uh, as well? It's like uh, a transplant uh, which failed. It's a failed 
uh, transplant, so, so to say. So these uh, copyright didn't work very well because people accepted it from the point of view of artists. Some of them accepted it in getting advantage of, of it, but they never uh, tried to completely exclude uh, their local references that say uh, the way they dealt with these music, they the way they dealt with these performances, the way they dealt with them in the local context before being confronted to these uh, European uh, contexts.